Welcome everybody. Uh, today's seminar is jointly hosted by Department of Computational Medicine, Bioinformatics, and the Genome Sciences Training Program. And we're really happy to have Dr. Catherine S. Pollard. Dr. Pollard is director of the Gladstone Institute of Data Science and Biotechnology, investigator at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, and professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and director of the Bioinformatics Graduate Program at UCSF. She earned her PhD in biostatistics from the University of California, Berkeley, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She has won a lot of prestigious awards, including the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, the Sloan Research Fellowship, and Alumna of the Year from UC Berkeley. Her lab developed statistical models and open source bioinformatics software for the analysis of massive genomic data sets. And she has over 150 publications including many in top journals like Nature Science, Cell, and Nature Genetics. Katie, thanks so much for speaking to us today, and we're excited for your talk. Thank you. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes. All right. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I've um, been looking forward to visiting and um, had to cancel for the pandemic, and now at least we get to see each other virtually. Um, so today the talk is about um, understanding the role of the structure of DNA in our efforts to decode how it functions. Um, but I actually want to start by um, talking about proteins for just a moment as a way to motivate the way that my lab's been thinking about DNA lately. Um, we all know the importance of uh, structure in our ability to interpret proteins and how they function and interact with each other and how mutations in the sequences of proteins alter their function. I'm showing in the background just two examples from the past year, some work on understanding host factors that interact with coronavirus um, and how important um, that work um, that we were part of, um, how important structure was to interpreting how host factors are evolving across mammal genomes. Um, in response to this virus and other viruses, and then predicting uh, whether different species would be susceptible to the virus. Um, I'm also showing uh, AlphaFold, which made a lot of uh, a splash recently, just back in November, by um, making through, through deep learning approaches um, big progress on the um, many years old challenge of predicting the structure of proteins de novo from their sequence alone. Um, and so uh, the reason that having models that link sequence to structure and structure to function has been so important for decoding how proteins work is that protein structures are dynamic. Um, they're hard to measure sometimes, not easily done in a high throughput way. Um, the models also help us um, understand the mechanisms of folding. So even if making the folding predictions themselves aren't necessary, it's still nice to have a model because a model teaches us about which features are important for the folding. Um, and finally, uh, once we have that kind of a, a model or understanding, then that facilitates the design of experiments, for example, mutations to test uh, the importance of different residues in protein function. So we all know this um, and the field of, of um, protein informatics and, and, and using structures in that has been going for decades. Structural biology is a huge part of, of, of protein biology, but it's less the case for um, understanding DNA. Um, structure has played a relatively smaller role there. And so um, the, the talk today has sort of a unifying theme that, that I believe this same same sort of sequence plays a role in structure and structure plays a role in function, the same sort of paradigm could be really transformative for our understanding of DNA and our decoding of how, how chromosomes and, and their sequences function. And I will say I've come to this thinking relatively recently. I've spent most of my career thinking about DNA like this as a sequence of letters and uh, a lot of work. Um, trying to find patterns or motifs in those letters. Um, and indeed, a lot of bioinformatics, I would say a large amount of, of human genetic research and bioinformatics research tries to understand the relationship between DNA sequences or genomic sequences and function, skipping structure completely. 
So I'm listing many examples here in my labs worked in, in most of these areas and probably most of you could think about your work and, and say that it's an example of one of these things. Um, and structure is just clearly absent from a lot of this, um, these paradigms or, or, or frameworks that we use. Um, but we know that DNA isn't really just a sequence of letters, it's a polymer. Um, it has, uh, when you zoom in this double helix structure, when you zoom out, it forms these um, more uh, complicated chromatin structures that um, are not random. There's a, a, a sense, there's some logic to how it gets scrunched up, how meters of DNA get scrunched up into every cell in our body. Um, so surely, you know, these beautiful structures must play a role in the relationship between the underlying sequence or the, the code of life that's in our DNA and, and how that code is read in our cells. Um, and in part, this has been an absent piece of the, the paradigm because it's been difficult to measure the structures of DNA, just like until we had uh, cryo-EM, it was kind of hard to see uh, structures of proteins. And there before that, it was crystallography was kind of a breakthrough in protein, understanding how proteins work. Um, recently, there have been some breakthroughs in understanding the structures of DNA um, at, at different um, with different strengths and weaknesses. So two technologies that, that we work with um, and that are uh, important in this field. One of them is chromatin capture experiments or HI-C. Um, and the idea here is that you can use sequencing of cross-linked pieces of DNA to measure the frequency um, with which uh, two regions of the genome are nearby each other in 3D space in a pool of cells that went into the sequencing experiment. And that data is shown here as a heat map. Um, and you can see very clearly this block diagonal structure. So there are local regions that have more interactions and then these boundaries across which fewer interactions happen um, that separate these domains um, referred to as TADs. Um, and then the sketch in the middle just shows sort of a, a cartoon of what that might look like in a nucleus. So there's this high C data. It's, um, it's pretty high resolution. Um, so if you, um, with the latest technologies and, and a decent sequencing budget, you can um, see interactions at sort of a kilobase or a couple kilobase um, resolution. Um, but it's a, um, a, a composite of many cells in order to get that resolution. There are single cell assays that, that measure these interactions in individual cells, um, but at, at much lower resolution and with a great deal of sparsity. A complementary technology is imaging. So you can look at individual cells and instead of saying on average, how often are two parts of the genome close enough to be cross-linked, you can just say, how close are they? And you can do that by putting a variety of different kinds of markers onto the chromatin fiber um, and, and basically painting them and then looking at where things are in a microscope. Um, the advantage of the microscopy um, is that it can be done on single cells. So you see actual events, it's not averages or composites. And it's also dynamic. You can look at it over time, um, like this uh, picture at the top, which is from a movie of loop extrusion. Um, a process by which chromosomes compact and form these um, TAD-like structures. So um, with these measurement technologies, um, we've been really thinking about how to integrate dynamic chromatin structure into bioinformatics models. So all these questions we've been asking about sequence function relationships, how do we get structure into the equation? And I think the motivations for doing this are really similar to those that I laid out at the beginning for proteins, just like protein CNA structures are dynamic. They're also hard to measure. Um, so if we could come up with a way to predict them de novo from sequence, that would um, be very powerful. Um, even when they are measurable, having a model that relates the sequence to the structure and the structure to the function can help us understand the underlying mechanisms and facilitate um, the design of experiments. So, so taking this paradigm from proteins and saying, well, why don't we just use this on DNA? Um, it also, um, it, it's also one of our goals to not just be able to predict things or see associations, but to use the models for mechanistic, me mechanistic interpretation. So to really let the models drive 
hypothesis-driven um, experiments about uh, how sequence um, and function are associated with each other. So unlike, say, a genetic association, that is when I see this, I tend to see that, uh, maybe um, a, a model that includes the structure of the DNA could say, well, you do see that relationship, say, between a non-coding variant and a gene, like an expression quantitative trait locus, you may see that because that uh, non-coding sequence is frequently nearby the promoter of the gene. Um, and then also uh, we can kind of flip things around and say, well, if DNA doesn't just randomly scrunch up inside of cells, but forms structures in kind of a predictable way, does that actually constrain sequence evolution? And finally, um, we are, are quite convinced, and I'll, and I'll end the talk on this point, that uh, thinking that about mutations that can alter phenotypes, whether that's in evolution or in disease, um, you know, there's been a lot of focus, of course, on mutations that change proteins. We know those are important. More recently, uh, mutations in enhancers and other kinds of regulatory elements that can control when genes are expressed, but there's still a lot of the genetic risk for disease that are not explained by our current understanding of the genes and their regulatory elements. And so um, we're very excited about the idea that mutations could function by changing the folding of the DNA. So they would impact the structure and by changing the structure, you change the function without potentially ever changing a protein or even its regulatory elements. But for example, changing the probability that those interact with each other um, or uh, some other function that comes from changing the structure of the DNA. So this is kind of the vision and, and the outline um, for uh, the lab at the moment and, and a lot of our projects. I'm gonna focus on three um, recent stories in the talk today. Um, and none of them do sequence structure and function and all the relationships into a single model. That's kind of a long-term goal, um, but uh, they do all have structure in them. So the first one is about how the structure of chromosomes um, constrain uh, their sequence evolution. The second story is about um, predicting the structure of chromosomes or their folding, 3D folding in the nucleus de novo, just from the sequence alone. And then finally, uh, using those structure predictions to inform how we think um, sequence mutations affect um, traits like uh, congenital heart defects. So um, let's start with the first story. Um, so part one, this is on structure and how that relates to sequence evolution. And this is work led by Xiaofen Jin um, with contributions from Jeff Fudenberg. So the, um, a lot of my lab has thought about point mutations and I'll talk later in the talk about structural variants, but actually the aspect of DNA sequence evolution I wanna talk about in this part of the talk is meiotic recombination. Uh, just to review, it's the reciprocal exchange of your grandparental genetic variants in your parents when they were making gametes to make you. Um, and it enhances DNA sequence diversity in populations by mixing together the variants from the grandparents into new combinations. And in mammals, um, the crossovers that happen in recombination are enriched greatly, like about a hundred fold in what are called recombination combination hotspots that are pretty small, one or 2,000 base pair long regions with a lot of the recombination. Um, and uh, evolution of where these hotspots are located affects sequence evolution as well, because uh, first of all, recombination itself is mutagenic, um, and it also constrains this um, mixing of diversity, of, of mixing of the grand parental variants. So which ones can get mixed um, and uh, unlinked from each other um, is really important uh, in the process of adaptation. Um, so uh, another role of meiotic recombination, of course, is that it ensures proper segregation of the chromosomes. It's necessary for that. And errors in it, um, in meiotic recombination, are important because they can lead to miscarriages and genetic diseases. So despite the fact that recombination is such a fundamental process, um, 
there's a lot of things about it that we don't understand. Um, and the question that uh, we're interested in here is the following. So uh, PRDM9 is a protein that helps mark where recombination happens. Um, and there are thousands of places that PRDM9 binds um, on a given chromosome. However, the most of those do not form double stranded, stranded breaks. Um, and that can be measured by the bind, um, binding of the protein DMC1. So on a given chromosome, there might just be tens of double stranded breaks. And from those approximately one crossover happens in each meiotic recombination. So we go from thousands to tens to ones. Um, and uh, it's been a big question for a long time is how, how those decisions get made, which ones form double stranded breaks and which of those form crossovers. And our idea was that this um, bottle brush structure that the chromosomes form during meiotic recombination, um, during meiosis, um, must be important. So maybe the, the place that a sequence falls on these loops um, in this bottle brush has something to do with whether it becomes a recombination hotspot or not. Does a recombination happen more like near the axis or does it happen more on the outside of the loops? Um, those were the questions that we wanted to try to address. Um, and inspiration for this came um, from first, um, several years ago now, from noticing, of course, that these block diagonal structures in the high C maps um, are, are not unlike uh, uh, linkage disequilibrium blocks. So if you take positions along the genome, and you look at how correlated genetic variants are with each other in a population, you will also see blocks called LD blocks that are broken up um, by uh, these breaks. And the breaks are where the recombination hotspots are. So there's this similar block diagonal structure that sort of suggests that maybe recombination is happening at the boundaries between the tabs. Maybe that these should be are aligned with each other in some way. So that um, was the idea behind a project led by Sean Whalen a couple years ago in the lab. And uh, he analyzed a great deal of data. It was a big engineering feat to do this. Um, and I'll just tell you the punchline from that story, um, which is previously published. Basically, there's no relationship at all at any scale between LD and the high C map. Um, that in, in the uh, 22 cell types that we studied in this, um, this paper. And you can see here, one of the main reasons is the scale is different. So the LD blocks are smaller. Um, in other words, there are many more recombination hotspots um, present over lots of evolutionary time, not in any given meiosis, but over time, many are used um, compared to how many boundaries there are between the TADs. Um, so you're sort of deep in the middle of a TAD here and you see lots of little LD blocks. We also asked if the, given that, maybe there's still, whenever you get to a boundary in the high C map, is it still a boundary in the LD map? And the answer to that was definitely no. Um, if anything, we saw the only pattern, which was pretty weak, but the only pattern we saw in this whole analysis was that the LD blocks tended to be a bit longer near the edges of the TADs and there tended to be bigger LD blocks sort of spanning over TAD boundaries. So if anything, it seems like recombination is avoided at the TAD boundaries, sort of the opposite of the hypothesis that, that I suggested on the previous slide. Um, so uh, that was kind of interesting and not what we had necessarily expected, but then we realized, of course, all these cell types that we're looking at um, where there's a lot of uh, high C data that's been generated in, for humans, um, they're all in interphase. They're actually not going through recombination. So maybe the high C map looks different in recombination. Now, it's not that we didn't sort of realize that ahead of time. We knew they were interphase maps and that recombination happened during meiosis. Um, so we knew we were comparing interphase and meiotic maps uh, uh, processes in kind of a, a mismatched way, but we thought it might be okay because when you look across these 22 different interphase cell types, the TADs and their boundaries are quite conserved. They don't change a great deal from one cell type to another. So we thought, well, maybe they're the same in meiosis too. 
So that, that, that result, however, begs the question of like, well, maybe the TADs actually change in meiosis. And, and maybe in hindsight, that's not such a surprising thing if they did, because it's these crazy bottle brush structures are farming. Um, so we partnered um, with Matt Neal and Steffi Schallbetter and looked um, in yeast um, because there um, it's easy to watch cells go through meiosis. You can synchronize them and you can do a lot of genetic mutants and try to figure out what's going on. And um, what happens actually is that the interface TADs generally for the most part disappear during meiosis. So these are um, time points here. And if you uh, sort of zero hours and eight hours are the two end points of meiosis. And um, if you look at four hours in the middle in prophase, which is where recombination happens, a lot of the structures, TAD-like structures are gone. And there's also this thickening of the band in the middle, which means that there's more local interactions. So there's a condensation of the chromatin, which we also already knew was happening. And we can see that in the high C map. So when you're forming the bottle brush, the TADs go away and you kind of scrunch things up even tighter. Um, not the point of the talk today, but by using yeast mutants and um, biophysically motivated polymer simulations, we were able to figure out um, some of the mechanisms driving these changes in the high C map during yeast meiosis and um, propose that um, the structures that are forming are the result of, um, of loop extrusion, similar to similar mechanism to what causes uh, TADs to exist during interphase. Um, but um, with uh, transition acting as a barrier. Um, so uh, with that kind of um, knowledge from yeast, we can kind of turn back now to mammals and ask what is the relationship between 3D chromatin structure and recombination in mammals? So this was all super interesting in yeast and we learned a lot, but that's yeast, maybe that's not what's happening in mammals. Um, and during the time when we were working on the yeast study, just in parallel, um, a lot of data was generated in mouse meiosis. There's still not much data on chromatin structure, uh, basically any on chromatin structure in human meiosis, um, but there is from mouse. And so Xiaofan um, collected up all this data on different things that are relevant um, to mouse meiosis. And I'm showing some of that as tracks in sort of a genome browser view here. They're really nice high C maps um, of the different stages of meiosis in mouse. Um, and there is information about where PRDM9 binds, where um, the double-stranded breaks happen, that's the DMC1 chip seek, and then we also know where the crossovers happen from sperm typing. Um, so if you look at the bottom of this kind of busy plot, you can see just what I explained already schematically that um, on this one region of the mouse um, chromosome, there are uh, a number of P PRDM9 sites and only a subset of those, the ones in purple boxes, um, have double-stranded breaks and really most of the crossovers happen at one of them in this region. So that's that winnowing down from lots of binding sites to less double-stranded breaks and from those to just a smaller number of crossovers. Um, so we wanted to use all this data to understand how those decisions get made um, in the cell. Um, and uh, we did some dimension reduction and summary of the data. There's a lot of different data that Shafan was working with and um, he did explore it individually, but he found that something that worked really well um, was to summarize all this data um, with principal components and then to use the principal components in a model. So this is just a summary of, of that uh, information and nicely, the reason we got excited about the principal components was that they basically represented conceptual features that we would like to model, like how accessible is a region? Um, does it have genes in it or not? Does it have active epigenetic marks or not? So with uh, this nice summary of all this genomic data, um, we went back to the question. So uh, out of all the PRDM9 sites, can we predict which ones form double-stranded breaks? Um, Shafan fit a generalized linear model with the principal components and some other covariates in it and um, in, uh, came up with this proposed configuration. So um, let me explain what I'm showing here. So this is a little piece of the bottle brush structure. 
And in dark blue are the gene pore, what we call a B compartment of the high C map. This is a part of the genome where there's not a lot of transcription happening and where um, the DNA is wrapped up tight around repressive histones. And for uh, the two blue loops that you see there, next to it, there are five um, brown loops. And that is the same amount, that's representing the same amount of genomic DNA, but it's less compacted and it's more uh, extended. So each of the loops of the same physical size is less base pairs of DNA in the gene rich or A compartment where a lot of transcription happens. So we have these more active regions and these um, more repressed regions. And so um, with that kind of model in mind, and then the axis um, is shown with the blue proteins there. With that kind of model of what is happening in the bottle brush, we can ask why do some D D um, PRDM binding sites form double-stranded breaks and some of them don't? Um, and the answer to that is that the double-stranded breaks happen um, preferentially in the active compartment. So, um, however, interestingly, the exact opposite is true for out of the double-stranded breaks that occur, which ones form crossovers amongst um, the, the double-stranded breaks in the active compartment, the ones that form a crossover are the ones away from the gene bodies in the, um, uh, the least active parts of um, the A compartment. So these locally repressed regions. Um, and so this was really interesting that the structure of the, of the DNA during recombination is highly predictive of both where the double-stranded breaks happen and also highly predictive of where the crossovers happen. Um, but the features of it that are, are me the mechanisms underlying these two uh, choices that the cell makes um, are, are different. Um, and we learned all that just from a, a model that included the, these structural features in it. Um, so that's a nice example of how understanding the structure and thinking about a process like recombination in the context of the structure of the DNA really changes our analysis. Prior to this, our own work and other people's was mostly just looking for sequence motifs that might predict these two events. And, and you know, the GC content is predictive. There are some motifs. Um, but we didn't really have a very deep understanding of it, nor could we predict particularly well where the crossovers happen. And now we can do that by integrating structure. So I'm going to transition to the second story. Um, in this one, we're going to talk about predicting the structure of chromosomes from the sequence alone. So this is sort of like alpha fold, um, but for chromosomes instead of proteins. Um, so uh, Jeff Fudenberg, along with Dave Kelly, um, developed a model called Akita. It's a convolutional neural network. And um, the architecture is shown here. The idea is that you give it some patches of the genome, and these are uh, one megabase of sequence. And uh, you show the computer what the high C map looks like in those one megabase windows. And you also give it as features just the sequence of that one megabase and no other information. And uh, you train a model to be able to predict uh, the high C map on patches of the genome that have been totally held out that aren't just, this isn't just cross validation, that sort of training and validation, but a completely held out test set. Um, and uh, amazingly, um, these uh, deep learning algorithms can predict the high C map or the frequency with which two parts of the chromosome are nearby in 3D space extremely well. Um, I'm showing on the bottom um, in the B panel there uh, on the right hand side where it says targets, that's the real data. And on the left hand side predictions, that's the, for that 1 million base pairs of DNA, that's what the computer thinks the high C map should look like. And it looks a great deal like the real one. And that is generally true. So um, here in D, you can see panel D, you can see that the mean squared error um, between the targets and the predictions is extremely low genome wide on, on the held out test data. The correlation is also extremely high in general. And when it's low, as indicated by the purple 
thought where you have low mean squared error, but also not a very good correlation between the targets, the, the real data and the predictions. Um, what's going on in those regions is that there's just not a lot of structure. The bottom panel C is an example of that, where there's just not a lot of interactions. It just kind of looks like white noise. The computer also predicts there's not a lot of interactions. So there's a low mean squared error, but not a high correlation between the, the noise profiles. And there's no reason if there's not much going on that the computer should be able to learn a relationship between the sequence and, and that pattern. So we were quite happy um, with that performance. Three more examples are on the right where um, the real data is on the top and um, you can see uh, what the computer predicts on the bottom. Um, and uh, and uh, these examples show that, um, that a variety of different kinds of structures can be predicted. Um, and that the boundaries often align with um, binding of the protein CTCF, which is known to help demarcate these boundaries. And they're often in open chromatin, but it's not a deterministic relationship. Neither of those alone is particularly predictive. There's a more complicated signature that the, the neural net is learning besides just those kind of features. So to try to figure out what that grammar is that the computer is learning, um, we performed a, a, a large amount of mutagenesis experiments on the computer. So in silico mutagenesis, training Akita was very computationally intensive, but once you have the trained model, you can feed in sequences that differ a little bit from each other and uh, quickly, relatively quickly, uh, without as much computational resources make predictions and then ask how different are those from each other. So does a mutation change the prediction very much? Does it create or destroy a tad boundary or create or destroy new interactions? And you can quantify that. And we do that with a disruption score. Um, and that score can tell us whether a mutation that we fed into the computer is important or not for determining um, the high CMAP or the structure of the chromosomes. And so not surprisingly, um, if we do that kind of an experiment for all known transcription factor binding motifs, so we took every protein that has a known motif, we found all of its motif instances in the genome and we um, scrambled them or um, ablated them. You can either like randomly mutate them or you can remove them completely. Either way, um, you uh, see that in some cases that will change the predictions, in some cases it won't. CTCF has the biggest disruption score, the biggest change in signal. Um, and then CTCFL is, is uh, its uh, sister protein that has a very similar motif. So that's probably just picking up on the same thing. There are other proteins that have statistically significant you know, disruption scores, but none of them as great as CTCF. So CTCF is super important. It's not just the motif itself, it's the or orientation of it. And it's also the occurrence of multiple CTCF motifs. Um, but as I already mentioned, if you just build a model based on CTCF motifs, it's not very good at predicting the high CMAP. So there's something else there as well. Um, we can ask where the biggest disruption scores are, if they correlate beyond these known, uh, the, the occurrences of these known transcription factor binding motifs, we can ask uh, where else in the genome do they occur? Um, the disruption scores are bigger at um, expression QTLs, so at genetic variants who's, where the allele is correlated with the expression of a gene. Um, and uh, when those are believed to be causal and not um, just in linkage disequilibrium with a variant that's causal according to the GTEx project, um, we see even larger disruptions than, than other EQTLs. We also see that known sort of annotated um, regulatory elements like promoters and enhancers have higher than average disruption scores, especially regions that are flanking CTCF sites. So there's a CTCF motif and then there's disruption, uh, high disruption scores, not at the motif itself, but in the flanking base pairs. So we asked what those might be and, and um, Here's an example um, where there's one of these EQTLs that has a high disruption score that's at the middle of the plot around the number 100 um, in the little purple box. Um, it is flanking um, about 70 base pairs away from a CGCF motif. And it turns out it's not just that one nucleotide, but around it, there are a number of nucleotides where any of the 
or most of the uh, other, um, changing the base to any or most of the other bases uh, has a big disruption score. And so this is a novel motif um, that, that in this part of the genome occurs near to CGCF and that we hypothesize might be helping to provide insulation at, at a TAD boundary. Um, so we have a number of these, um, these novel um, patterns that Akita has taught us and, and our work now is to understand how they function exactly. They are predicted to be important on the computer and then we can try to figure out if that's actually the case through experiments. Um, but what I think is really cool is that Akita, out of all the billions of mutations you could make in the genome, Akita helps us really prioritize um, which ones we would wanna look at. And I love to think of like the idea that, that these machine learning algorithms can make us more efficiently efficient in the lab, that we can design better experiments and, and generate knowledge more rapidly by using the computer to help us design the experiments. Um, Akita also highlights the importance of um, the sequence motifs, that the sequence structure relationships, the idea that those might not be the same in every species. So um, we looked at the mouse genome. We were interested in going over to mouse because there are a lot of um, perturbation experiments I'll tell you about in a minute where people have used CRISPR to edit the mouse genome and then measured the effect on the 3D genome folding. We wanted to use that data and we didn't really wanna retrain the Akita model which took a long time on a lot of GPUs. Um, and so we thought, well, let's just use the human model on the mouse data. So we wanted to see um, how well does Akita predict uh, the high seed maps when the um, model is trained on the human genome, but applied to the mouse genome. And then we asked whether it can predict the measurement of the high seed map in mice. And it did really, really well, except in areas that contain these B2 sign elements. And signs are a lineage specific um, repetitive element that's in the murine lineages. Um, and, um, and Akita did really badly at predicting um, the, the uh, structure around these B2 signs, which was kind of interesting. It's a motif that's not in the human genome, so Akita could never have learned it. And maybe that wouldn't have mattered, but it turned out right around the time that we were writing up our study, um, it was shown that B2 signs, especially when they are expressed, can create TAD boundaries. They, they look a little bit like a CTCF motif and they can actually function a bit like a CTCF motif. Um, they're different enough from the motif in the human genome that Akita didn't learn them, um, but uh, they are functionally important in the mouse genome. So a place where Akita failed actually is where we learned the new biology in this case. So that's important uh, as well. Um, not just when it does well, but also when it does badly to ask why. Um, and when we uh, mask out the B2 sign elements, we can make uh, beautiful predictions uh, in the mouse genome as well, like this one that matches very well the measured map. So we can fix the error uh, that it makes if we mask out B2 signs. So the last part of the talk is just Say so now that we have these sequence to structure models, this Akita framework, how can we really use that more deeply to understand function, how chromosomes function? And in particular, to understand the relationship between sequence, so mutating the sequence and how it functions. So whether that's a mutation that occurs during evolution, like what makes a human different from a chimp, or whether it is uh, mutations that occur in disease. So we're working on both. And so our idea was to get structure into that equation and to use Akita to help understand sequence function relationships. So we trialed out this idea using um, data generated by others, as I mentioned, in the mouse, where people have uh, leveraged the CRISPR technology to play around with the mouse genome and see how it changes the high C map or changes the frequency of being nearby in 3D space. Um, so first I'll show you some data from uh, Kraft et al. This is a synthetic inversion in the EPH4A locus. Um, they went in and they flipped around the orientation of a sequence uh, nearby one of these TAD boundaries. So on um, the right hand side at the top is the wild type high C map. So that's what the 3D folding of the genome normally looks like there. And then on the bottom right is 
what they measured in the, uh, the mouse with the inverted chromosome, the inversion inserted into its chromosome. So you can see that the inversion makes uh, a big change in the high C map, maybe not surprising. Um, if there is a sequence structure relationship, turning a sequence around should move something around on the high C map, and indeed it does. Um, and what we show on the left there is that when you feed in the wild type or the inverted sequence into a KEDA, it, all, it predicts what you see in the high C map. The predictions look uh, like their counterparts in, um, in the measured data. And this is without ever having seen this locus. This is a model trained. Um, uh, here we went and we actually trained it on mouse um, to do, so we could have the B2 signs included and um, it hasn't seen this part of the genome before. Um, and it certainly hasn't seen this inversion before. So it's learned some rules, Akita and the algorithm and then um, can make these predictions. So that's one example. Here's another one. Um, and in this case, um, there was a deletion made. Um, and here, uh, this was in human cell lines. Um, and so what you can see uh, across the top there is the unperturbed and the deleted data. Um, and uh, very clearly a loss of the interaction that's marked with the circle. And then the box in the unperturbed that's quite blue, meaning very little interaction gets quite red in the deletion. So um, a merging of two tads essentially and a gain or an ectopic interaction happening there. So that's the real data. On the bottom is what Akita predicts. And again, um, the effect of this genomic perturbation is accurately predicted by the model. Um, and uh, again, um, the model hadn't seen this part of the genome or this deletion before. So knowing that we could predict synthetic mutations quite accurately, um, we now went and asked whether we could use Akita to interpret genetic variants that we see in sick kids. Um, and uh, the piece of data I'm going to show you today is on congenital heart defects. We're also working on autism and developmental delay. Um, and the motivation in all of these, and in particular with CHDs, is that a lot of the kids don't have a known protein coding mutation. Um, and so there's a question that they and their families have, um, and then scientists have, you know, in terms of mechanisms of uh, what is causing their disease. Um, our idea was that their genomes might not be folding properly. And we thought that maybe Akita could predict that by taking their mutations and um, predicting, making predicted high C maps for them. Um, and this is without actually performing high C on, on the sick kid. So the idea um, is that if they don't have any known protein coding mutations, um, maybe it's something regulatory. We and others have spent a lot of time looking for enhancer mutations and there are some, um, but there are relatively limited examples in congenital heart defects. Um, and so the idea would be, well, maybe the proteins are intact and the regulatory elements or enhancers are intact, but maybe mutations are changing the probability that those find each other in the 3D nucleus and changing the regulation of the proteins or the opposite. Maybe a protein is interacting with an enhancer it's not supposed to interact with and it's getting expressed at the wrong time or place during development. And this is kind of plausible for congenital heart disease because there are single uh, proteins when, that when mutated or um, haploinsufficient do cause holes in the heart or other kinds of valve defects. And so misregulation of a single protein can cause CHD. Um, so we thought, well, maybe that misregulation could be happening through uh, misfolding of the genome rather than loss of the protein itself or loss of its enhancers. So this was our idea. Um, and uh, we wanted to see whether Akita could offer any support for any of these uh, kids being sick due to ectopic expression of a gene through um, misregulation or through misfolding of the genome. So we took um, hundreds of kids uh, that didn't have a known protein coding mutation. We identified mutations that were de novo in them, um, not seen in their parents. And then we scored them with Akita. And we can quite rapidly screen a lot of mutations. Um, and I'm just showing you one example here that was very striking. There are um, a few dozen others that look very good like this and some that are kind of a little less conclusive. And then there's some kids where we still don't know what's going on. 
Um, but this looks like a really great candidate for exactly the mechanism I just hypothesized about. So what we see here is a pretty small deletion, just 68 base pairs. Um, it occurs at the middle of these high C maps. And if you uh, look on the left, that's the high C data that we have. Um, it's not as high resolution. Um, this is from a heart data set. Um, it hasn't been sequenced as, sequenced as deeply as the, um, some of the cell line data that I've been showing you. Um, but uh, Akita actually sort of helps with the uh, resolution. Um, so uh, the middle is what Akita thinks the wild type genome looks like. And it, it looks pretty consistent with the target there or the, or the observed data. Um, and it and gives us a little bit better resolution or detail. Now the 68 base pair deletion is right at the middle of this patch. And you can see it as the white cross on the right hand plot. And it occurs right at a boundary between these two domains that seem to not interact very much with each other. So uh, the prediction for this uh, part of the genome with the deletion inserted, which is on the right, shows a merging of the two TADs, a gain of, a great, of, of, of interactions um, between these loci, um, including in the next TAD over, um, in that sort of green rectangle, some uh, gain of interaction uh, with the STRA6 gene, which is known to be a disease gene um, in congenital heart disease. Um, and all three of the genes, um, there, there are three genes that are in these TADs, um, uh, two additional ones that are also expressed during heart development. So this looks like a locus with a bunch of heart expressed genes that are being uh, separately regulated and insulated from each other in the normal genome. And this mutation seems like it could have messed that up. So we're now testing this by generating uh, induced, induced pluripotent stem cell lines with and without the six base pair mutation. And uh, measuring the chromatin interactions in the gene expression in this locus, as well as uh, across the genome, to see if this mutation um, that doesn't hit any particular regulatory element or gene could be a, a 3D folding mutation. Um, so uh, unfortunately, that work was slowed down by COVID, and, and I wish I had the results to show you, but um, hopefully we will know the answer soon. So this rapid in silico screening of mutations is pretty powerful. Um, we are also applying it to autism. Um, another project is asking about variants that are never seen in people. So you might think, okay, you know, a variant seen in a patient, you could just have gone and gotten that person's cells um, and done the high C. Now, in the case of a heart defect, you know, the kids now had a surgery and grown up. I'm not sure that they're current heart would be that informative, maybe it would. Um, but in some other cases, you know, you probably could do the measurement in the patient. But what about mutations that are embryonic lethal or that are so rare that it's very hard to observe them in people? Like, could that help us understand these mechanisms of 3D genome folding even better than these mutations that we at least create a living person, albeit a sick one? Um, so we're kind of interested in what Akita thinks is happening. Um, in very rare or, or never observed mutations. We're also using Akita to study evolution. Um, we have a project comparing human and chimpanzee genomes and I'm excited about that because other work um, in the lab uh, has shown that uh, human accelerated regions or enhancers that are very different between humans and other mammals are enriched uh, nearby structural variants like the one that I just showed you for the CHDs. And so we think a similar kind of mechanism could have happened during human evolution and led to the rapid evolution, you know, the rapid sequence change in these enhancers because they're now interacting with a new gene. Um, and then finally, uh, a case where you only have the computer, you can't make the measurement. We're looking at Neanderthal and other archaic hominin genomes where the DNA has survived in fossils. The cells don't exist. We can't measure their 3D genome folding, but Akita can sort of resurrect or predict what their high C maps would look like. And that's a collaboration with Tony Capra's lab. So to wrap it up, um, I've talked today about the importance of the dynamic 3D structures or the 3D folding of chromosomes and how I think that uh, including them in our thinking has been so exciting and so helpful for our efforts to understand sequence function relationships. Um, the structure uh, showed us um, 
that uh, that how chromosomes fold uh, constrains how they evolve, and, and that was a story about recombination. I showed you that the sequence, the structure can be predicted de novo from only the sequence. So, like alpha fold for proteins, we can do de novo prediction of chromatin structures, and then we're just the work that I uh, left off with at the end, and, and that um, we'll be continuing to work on is to see how we can use these models now to understand the mechanisms through which non-coding mutations that we haven't been able to interpret can now be interpreted better in terms of their effect on, on, on function and on human health. And what I didn't talk about was the other direction, which was, does the function of the genome drive its structure? We're also interested in that question. I touched on it briefly in the yeast meiosis story saying that transcription itself can create boundaries uh, and, and um, and can constrain the folding of the genome. So we're also interested in, in that direction. Um, so here's the folks in the lab. I've labeled the ones who contributed to the stories today um, along with those collaborators and our funding and I'd be happy to take your questions. Great, thanks so much, Katie, for a great talk. My pleasure. So um, if anyone has questions, you can unmute yourself and just ask directly. I have a question. Um, so, um, what is the rationale for uh, for those structural variants where you try to predict their pathogenicity? Um, I, I, I'm I'm thinking of the large scale variants. Uh, uh, what is the rationale for predicting high C maps rather than predicting the impact of the expression of the genes that are known to be involved in those those diseases? Why introduce this intermediate step? Yeah, that's kind of like the whole um, the whole point um, that I was trying to make. So let me try to make it again. I don't think you need it. I mean, for many things in biology, you could just go from sequence to function. Like you could predict expression of a gene from sequence of its promoter or its regulatory elements, or you could predict pathogenicity of a SNP so its effect on a phenotype. Um, and I, I think that's great. Like we have a ton of work in my lab that does that as well. Um, but there are a lot of cases where either we don't predict as well as maybe we could. So maybe adding in the structure, this intermediate step might improve the predictions. Or even if it doesn't, it provides a mechanism. So, you know, people make predictions for a lot of reasons. One of them is just that the predictions are valuable themselves. That's fine, but I think a lot of the reason that we fit models in biology is that we want to use the model, we want to interpret the model to get at underlying mechanisms of like, why does something happen? And so a model that predicts the pathogenicity of a structural variant or that a, a structural variant would alter the expression of a nearby gene, um, it, it it hints at why, but it doesn't really tell us why. It doesn't get through like at the level of of molecules, like how is that happening? Um, and so that's what we're interested in doing. So thanks for the question. Thank you. Can I ask? That was really- Yes, hi. Hi. Um, so I'm curious about the aspects of 3D genome structure that change from cell type to cell type. Yes. And, and whether, and the extent to which you can model that kind of variation? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, high C maps are not super different from one cell type to another. There are some small differences. They're mostly inside the TADs and not like as big as these like mergings of TADs that I just showed you. Um, so most of the TAD boundaries are conserved. Um, because if you take two cell types, because there aren't a lot of differences, at the resolution that we can measure. So high C doesn't have fantastic resolution. You know, it's down to maybe five kilobases. At that resolution, we don't see a ton of cell type differences. Therefore, it's kind of, it's um, uh, maybe not surprising that Akita didn't learn a lot of cell type differences. There are loci of the genome where it, we trained it on five or six, six cell types. It does in a few loci make different predictions like stronger or weaker TAD boundaries or maybe a little merging of TADs in certain loci of the genome, which are interesting. But overall, it doesn't predict a lot of differences. However, if you look at the underlying data we gave it to learn, it also didn't 
those didn't show a lot of cell type differences. So I have a student in the lab, Laura, is now working on exactly that problem. Um, and instead of trying to learn like six different high C maps for each locus of the genome, she's trying to do a supervised learning on the differences between them. So making the thing you're trying to predict the differences and see if that works better. Um, I also think as we get higher resolution maps or maybe we need to use the imaging data. So I talked about imaging at the beginning and then I mostly showed you genomic data. I think um, she's also working with imaging data and maybe that will have like a better resolution to see these differences. There's some um, nice results that show, recent ones that show just small pieces of DNA that move quite a lot when genes get turned on and off. And so I, I think we need to first get the measurement problem solved and then we see if the computer can learn it. Yeah. Does that help answer? I think so. I guess, yeah, there's these categories of things that high C can and cannot tell us. And so things mm -hmm. like global inversions of where the heterochromatin is might be at a different scale than what's, you know, you said like it doesn't, high C can't measure really small things, but then also these very large topological. Yeah. Regions, right. Maybe also isn't ideally suited to what high C can see. Yeah, I think you're right. I do. I think it's sort of the medium scale where it's good. Um, and the big uh, scale is harder. Absolutely. Yeah. And th there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens at that big scale too. So yeah, I think it, it, my hunch is imaging is going to get us there in the next few years, but we'll see. A quick question. Um, <clears throat> have you uh, looked at, let's say, like, I don't know, getting rid of MED1 or P300 or TAS1, some of these kind of proteins associated with these uh, TADs, um, have those basically like remodeled sort of the predictions that Akita might make or made no difference or just were non-functional cell lines or anything like that? Yeah, so you're talking about modifying the proteins. Um, yeah. As you as you probably know that uh, you, you changed where cohesin stops or you change how much it loads onto the chromatin and that will um, dilute the TAD structures. Um, they'll, they'll sort of go away. Like if you take away the, the CTCF, then the uh, loop, the cohesin complex will just keep extruding and you won't have such strong TAD boundaries, for example. Um, so these protein mutations have a big effect. There are also some chromatin modifying proteins that have big effects. Uh, or uh, relatively big effects. Um, what Akita has learned is in a normal cell with normal proteins, what the relationship between the DNA sequence and the structure is. And so it doesn't have a way to know about a protein. We've like never given it proteins, given the computer proteins as like part of the story. It's probably learning the DNA motifs to which proteins bind and if you ablate those motifs, it can change the predictions, but we can't ablate the protein. Um, so yeah. So, so yes, we've seen some cases where ablating the protein binding sites have effects, but you can't in this framework ablate the protein. However, um, we do have a project in the congenital heart defect um, air, you know, area where we are doing some of those protein ablations and measuring how the high C map is different. Um, then you have like different data that you can give the computer and be like, this is what the high C map looks like with CDCF. This is what it looks like without, or this is what it looks like with the chromatin remodeler. This is what it looks like without. Then, then um, the computer could probably learn like what you were hoping it would learn. But right now it hasn't seen that data yet. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. Any other Hi, questions? I a, yeah, I had a question about uh, part one of your talk. Um, yeah, so about recombination. Exactly. Yeah. So I remember uh, kind of vaguely, you might have to jog my memory, but you're saying that the, the frequency of crossover was uh, had to do with the amount of uh, transcriptional activity uh, in, the, in the DNA region. And so I was wondering if you had looked at um, maybe like mutations that cause changes in uh, transcriptional activity, if that was also uh, causing a change in the amount of crossover that was happening. Yeah. So in the yeast study, um, we did do a bunch of mutants. Um, but they were more like the ones I was just discussing on the previous question. We looked at removing um, uh, proteins that dictate uh, where the cohesin loads and how like long it stays on the DNA. Um, we did not, so there isn't a CTCF in yeast. Um, and so, you know, you can't do a CTCF deletion because they don't have it. Um, 
And uh, we realized sort of searching for what was forming the boundaries, we realized kind of late in the project that transcription was important. We didn't um, you know, try to turn off transcription, but that is the obvious next experiment to do, um, but we haven't done it yet. So, but the, the prediction would be that you would, if you turned it off, you could merge two tads, for example. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. All right, any more questions for Katie? I guess I have a quick follow-up, which is, um, have you guys actually inserted some of these sort of protein binding sites to see if you could actually create new TADs? Yeah, you can. Cool. You can even like design the perfect TAD kind of, you can make like a really good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if it does anything useful biologically, but like you can make a really strong TAD boundary. It's pretty easy. You just make a bunch of CTCF binding sites that are inward facing and yeah, it's not too hard. So. Have you observed any of that, like actually creating in, in the actual cell line experiments, creating of these like, um, and I know it might not be a totally agreed upon thing, like these LLPS or, um, you know, these transcriptionally active condensates? Is that something oh, that you- right. Yeah. How does all this relate to like um, phase transitions or whatever, right? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, we haven't looked at that, but- um, but I think it's a very interesting question whether any of this is happening like in nuclear speckles or in some other kind of like droplets or something. Um, very interesting, but I no, we haven't looked at that yet. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we will wrap it up here. So thanks again, Katie. Yeah, thank you all. It was great spending time with you, albeit virtually. <laughs> Thanks.